question with our Lakota, with our storytelling program. We have Leola, Leola One Feather doing um, Lakota designs, showing us her Lakota designs through beadwork. So I'll let you go take it off. Okay. Um, if you could look at, kind of span into this area where the, the beadwork is on the table. Um, most of this I made here and um, I tried to really interpret the designs of everything I made and this is probably only a small percentage of beadwork I made in my lifetime and uh, I'd like to start with this pair here and this is kind of really <coughs> looks beat up and they're a little pair of baby moccasins and these were mine and I'm in my 60s now so these little shoes here are like 60 years old and the reason they are, they're, s they're still holding together is because um, they're made the original way when our grandmothers made moccasins, they're rawhide um, right here deer from our creeks that her nephew shot and tanned it and then the beads uh, she bought in Rapid City and Custer, Keystone, these places used to have this type of bead. And, um, but we have a lot of stories about the bead at Solon, the moxin are just death moxins, but I'm alive. <laughs> so the interpretation isn't always correct because the souls were beaded so that um, the story my mom told me is that it teaches us to be real gentle how we walk on the earth. And that's how I walk when I take a walk anywhere. I really try to be careful where I walk because um, a lot of our culture is based on um, we didn't damage the earth. So, But anyway, they're kind of chewed up, but I'm going to loan them to the archives here at OLC so that if anybody coming in and doing beadwork and wants to look at designs or how they're constructed, they're ideas. And and I think that because um, a lot of the designs I make have been here since we got beads and I do reproduction so I wanted to share these so these will stay here for maybe a year or so maybe maybe longer but so people could see them and uh, they're really beat up so that means I really wore them <laughs> and all my kids wore them I have eight kids and um, even though they were kind of tattered I'd fix them up and and it was always funny because it was like I played a trick on them because when they first start walking and they wore them, they always fell down on a regular floor in the house. So I would take them outside and they'd play in them. And they just kind of got more and more, more ripped up. But I wanted them to feel how I felt when I was a baby. So they would, you know, kind of be like me, <laughs> maybe. So that was one. And one of the things um, I wanted to do is especially to thank the college here because we have um, such a, a big um, educational arena with Pine Ridge's uh, college centers plus Rapid City, Eagle Butte and, um, and then we have all the American Indian higher education colleges that tune into these sites to look at you know what are we doing, how are we doing but we also have the world that looks at us so um, I have a friend in Guatemala who's with some elders and I wanted to give her a shout out because these ladies who come to our country, they have real similar living conditions so a lot of this stuff is their economy and um, one of the pairs here I wanted to show is uh, my little grandson Onashala. They're really tiny and um, I really, I put little horses on there because I named him Onashola. And Onashola is probably, he's the only one that has that name and it means prancing, dancing horse. And um, he was my grandfather, Nupa, whose name was Tutu. That was his father. So we're from two tribes, actually several, but we're from the original band of Chief Smoke. And so the band I'm from is called the Makaha. And one of the things we were known for in the women in our um, Teoshpai were they were excellent bead workers. 
and they put stories into their beadwork that we all think are really pretty so each one might have a little story and this one is horses I put horses on her and today he's gonna be 12 years old but he really had a a, b a hard beginning because he was only 14 inches long and he weighed one pound and nine ounces and now he's this big so he's our miracle baby so these are the miracle babies and this pair here is my granddaughter Anna Mae and she's she has uh, Down syndrome so I made her moxin a little bit different on the other side and I put a design in here that like a little box to link that because she has three sets of 21 chromosomes and so she's really special and today Annie is she sings she has a candle um, and she she understands Lakota really good so I think we're gonna have speakers in our family and we don't speak all the time but when we do we we have really good listeners who pick up the language so I found out through beadwork that you know you could teach language because it's like your every thought every prayer my son told me goes into his beadwork and I was thinking gee how about every song you know sometimes you're singing or humming or doing something and it so I don't know how I'll find out but I think those have a song okay and then another pair here we lived in a really cold house I still live in it when Anna Mae was a baby so in order to keep her feet from freezing I put socks on her and then I put these on her and uh, then I put her pajamas over but what Annie would do with these moccasins is she'd lift her feet and she'd look at these designs and that's what I wanted to have her be aware that there's a lot of color and that uh, the story of colors and how they came to earth were um, when a uh, fallen star woman comes to earth she brings uh, a bag and I didn't bring a beaded bag I forgot what was I thinking so when she opens this bag what comes out of there are all these color uh, birds of the rainbow and those birds today that's why our connection to the world as Lakota people is really important especially like to the south of us right now we're having all the migration of the birds coming and all the birds that we see are like in our beadwork but we do more um, geometric but once in a while you'll see really uh, old designs like um, one of the designs I found was um, a book here and I think it's this one is the um, American Indian art but they're pictograph scenes so I don't have any of that beadwork with me today so these were really um, really good she didn't catch cold and on the back I made like these little dragonflies so I, they were kind of like a geometric type of design that I and these are made with um, size 13 and size 14 cut beads <coughs> then I have a pair here that I made for um, Deja she's my little six-year-old granddaughter and this one I beat at the sole too and this one has a, a petroglyph design on it but we lost the other side so anybody out there sees this moxin it's Deja's <laughs> my granddaughter <laughs> and another pair of Annie's I made here where when her feet started to get a little bit wider she ripped them but these ones I made little stars on the side of it and if you zoom in you could see those little they're red stars and the winter she was born there was a a really bright red star in the sky that I seen and it was like tumbling towards me so I didn't know how to really make it round but I wanted to make it geometric so I made it sideways and then I made little dragonflies on the back so and this is it's different because this is kind of like a variation of um, a crow style design mocks and it's a little different that's usually how crows do their beadwork but I was just inspired to do that that day so I made these and um, 
Are these on those or those or something? Something? Oh, another pair of Onashalas. And uh, his mom's name is White Butterfly. And that's a really amazing um, story of this man named White Butterfly. And it, it tells, uh, they might have the story here in archives, but it's a story of a man who is a holy man. And they weren't allowing our people to Sundance. It was still in the 1920s. And they put him in jail for Sundance and for praying. So the story about him is he took a cigarette paper and he cut it into little pieces and he blew it out the window. And his sacred powers all came around this courthouse and they went to visit a judge. So the judge let everyone out of jail because they were just praying, they didn't do anything wrong. And then this pair I made for uh, my grandson Zion, and he's 12, and he's kind of like a little bear. It's real chubby, he didn't talk, he just kind of growled. <laughs> and he had real square feet, kind of like little bear paws. So I made bear paws on his. And he's, he's really big today, he's, he's only, uh, be 12 years old too. He's only 11. But then I made him dragonflies too because their legs ache and we use dragonflies to um, take pain away. And they're just cures that we, we do. And um, these are all anime moxins and they're really beat up because this is when she was crawling all over the floor. So that's why I try to, when I make moxins on white leather, I try to bead the whole thing because you put a a pair of moccasins on and within like 10 minutes <laughs> they're all dirty <laughs> and then you know they're wearing them but if you want the don't want your leather to get dirty it's probably best to bead the whole thing all right and I'll get to these these were um, these are kind of a big pair <laughs> they grew up <laughs> these are my youngest daughters and I made these for her because she made to, went to womanhood ceremony, so I made her teepee right here, right here. And then I put these red and white stripes here because a lot of, after the um, Battle of the Little Bighorn, there was a lot of beadwork that would um, come out about that time that had these stripes, but they were minus the stars. And maybe it was just because they had red and white beads. But it's kind of, it's like a theme, a decoration. So when I researched it, they were bands that they made for, the women would make beadwork on their beadwork for their brother or her dad who went to war. And so my grandmother, in World War II, my mother's mother, her name was Maple Whiteface. She was a sergeant in the United States Army. And um, she came back, she was a very strong woman. So. I do the red and white for my grandmother because she um, she's a descendant of our grandfathers who fought a battle and we won, our grandfathers won, so we hold a really um, esteemed record that our people did not want to be removed so they fought knowing that the military had more powerful weapons, but they stayed. So those accounts are really, they're really huge, and it's really a lot of people. <coughs> and then the leggings I made to this. This I did a story for my daughter, because when she was a baby, I had a dream of a sun dance at the Bears Lodge, and, and she was our little sun dance tree girl there. So I made this to symbolize life from the male and the, fe the female and the male. So this one I made a turtle, but I made it like in a medicine wheel. And I really liked how the, the Zuni and the Hopi do this real beautiful shading. And to me, it's like the universe is with this turtle because he was the first, or she was the first. And then this one is a lizard, but I just, made it more abstract. So the turtle and the lizard are the beginning 
of our creation. And along the bottom of this line here, I beaded seven mountains. And these seven mountains are what they call the Wichinchala Shakomi, the Pleiades. So the highest mountain is where our story is. Uh, a fossil legend of seven little girls being killed by a red eagle. And that when I heard this story, my grandmother would scare the living daylights out of me that if we stayed outside too long, this big red eagle would take us and snatch us and we'd just be bones. <laughs> so we, we stayed inside, yeah, but we outgrew it eventually. But that the fossil legend tells a time when we could really say confidentially that our language is one of the, could possibly be the oldest language on this continent. And this is a big continent. So it extends all the way to the tip of South America as one huge piece of land. So these, these I think are all real similar that people dream designs that are real similar. And then I beaded a feather here. And the feather I put there was <coughs> a story of a holy man told us that along in the Milky Way, because we live in the constellation of, um, or in the galaxy of the Milky Way, in the arm of Orion, that there's a giant eagle feather up there. So every, all through the day and night, there's always a big feather above us. So I put that there for them, <coughs> the recognition. And then when I folded it here, it makes another design. So it's always like a mirror image. But they got wet and I had to take them apart. So they have to still be done. And then the other piece I did, there's more pieces and I lost them. This one was, um, when she was born, Haley's comet was exiting the Earth. And when I, um, as an astronomer, and to all the teachers, the people who taught me, they were mostly medicine men. I had a star dream when I was a little girl. Uh, Haley's Comet is a warrior that comes to protect the Earth. So I made this Haley's Comet to acknowledge. So a lot of the, these, uh, this beadwork I do with stars is to acknowledge those stars because we can't make stars yet. They're trying, but has it happened? So energy is different. And then this this little shirt I made here, again is Onashalas, and we call him our miracle baby because he was only a pound, and he had tiny little hands. And here I I beaded another dream I had. It was a blue horse, and the blue horse gave us instructions to, we, our stories are that the horse came as a gift from the Thunder Nation, and there's variations. And then our horse history books in America say we, were, we weren't able to develop or evolve because we didn't have the horse, but we did. So I can challenge that because if we have a horse dance and a really sacred activity where horses can heal, you know, diseases and people that are like cancer and diabetes, that, um, that's our, our dance, that's what they gave us. So maybe people in the other places who have horses used to have ceremonies too. But, you know, I don't know how to find out <laughs> somehow. And then I did a medicine wheel there because we're from Wundetni, and Wundetni is a really important place in our history and I own land there but I know I'll never sell it because it's a very historical place where people come and only one of the many places in America but we have our own colors there our colors are red yellow green and blue and we also have songs our community has songs so <coughs> they were paid for with horses a long time ago so that's his little shirt and he's got leggings, and, and then I made his moccasins too, right here. So I put little buffalo skulls on there. And he really likes to go to sun dance, because um, we have giveaways for children 
and that's really beautiful because most gift giving usually goes to elders or you know visitors but when we started having giveaways for children it was like understanding that giveaways just don't happen at Christmas or at a Sundance we should always have giveaways for little children so they'll get gifts you know and um, so that was what I learned at that and then this is a hair piece which is um, where we make a braid and when we have our Lakota name a feather goes on here and so our story is is when long ago there was a flood and um, <coughs> all the people died and there was just one woman left and one day an eagle came and he hunted for her and so the our version that I know from my grandmother and she took us there was a really high place in the Black Hills and that's where she survived and so today when that eagle when she was lonely and became a human they have twins and the twins are, are how they multiplied really fast because there were other survivors so everything multiplied twice so we called the twins Takini they, they live again so it's kind of how we got to be a big nation real fast and I have twins I have um, on my grandmother's side, nine sets of twins. I think there's like 13 now. And on my paternal side, there's probably like maybe the same amount. So I had 18 relatives real quick on this side and 18, 36 people <laughs> really fast. So that, and then this other piece up here is not beat it, but this one is, um, when I was a little girl, I, because I had a grandma that went to the army and she had, you know, some amount of wealth, she had cattle and horses, she, they would commission people to make things for me. So when I was seven years old, they gave me my name, and my name is Tatiya Balashtewi. And they made me a dress similar, it was a penny dress. And when I asked, what, where, do I, where did the ceremony come from where we put coins? because I seen some really old pictures where they were like big nuggets of copper. And they said, long ago, our people lived at a place on their journey where they made copper. And the copper was what they used to, to trade with. So today we have what is called the penny dance. But when you have this ceremony called the Mazasha, and they give you a name and they put a dress on you like this, your rule throughout life is that you're generous. So my bank account is almost zero all the time. <laughs> so so when you're you in our world we you have to live it to to be, you know, you just can't fake it or four days a year be an Indian and like that or whatever. So um I'll take a drink here. And the other thing that's real captivating is we have people like in other countries. So, and uh, this is the last pair of moccasins, my latest pair. I have like three more. I have a quill pair I didn't bring. But it's real simple and I didn't have any beads. I was out traveling. So one size here is really big. It's like a size 10. And the next size is uh, 11. And then this is a cut bead. But I wanted to make a replication of something I thought, you know, some one of our grandmothers would have made. So I made this, and um, what I put on here was a Cheyenne design. So I hope my Cheyenne relatives forgive me because I'm part Cheyenne too. <laughs> and on here is a is the, um, Bear Butte, and it's called the the Mountain of a pregnant woman laying down. And if you look at it sideways, you see her head, and then you see the butte, and you see her knees. And then the, the little doorway that I put there was for sweet medicine. Because this story is, he's a star man, and he came to Bear Butte, and he lived there for 
it was his realm for like 800 years so this is this is to to pay homage to him and to honor him that we're still here and his story is on these shoes so my grandson could walk in sweet madness and walk in sweet grass so that's what we call sweet grass today all right and let's see uh, one more here it's their little coin purses and usually when um this happens not usually naturally <laughs> it starts out with two moccasins and one side gets lost <laughs> so you'll see like that little one right here you'll see people with a moccasin and it's because one side got lost so they'll turn it into a little uh, coin purse and they still so I used to have one like this because I remember I really lost a, a pretty pair of moccasins that were my, my baby moccasins so um, So I um I remember having a coin purse made out of my little moxin <laughs> and I lost it. <laughs> so yeah, so they're they actually become something else. And that's one of the things I had seen a lot of in in um studying artwork and beadwork and repatriating and um looking at big collections is that sometimes say a, a teepee um the smoke flaps when they get really hardened that's what they made the soles of moccasins with because they were like baked but I, I could imagine what it'd be like trying to get a needle through there it'd be like sitting there with uh, like having uh, your own drill <laughs> trying to drill it because when it becomes baked it's really really hard so it's hard to um, to sew and I didn't bring on any more stuff I know Tawa. okay so um, I wanted to tell a little story too about how a couple interpretations of what are called the one of them is the Sioux legend and uh, I want to thank my brother Leland little dog and I think uh, they're gonna be tuning in over in Rosebud so if uh, our Sichungu relatives are tuning in we always <coughs> we have to attribute where we get our stories from so um, this story is about the woman weaving the, the buffalo robe and and I must not have been listening real good because I, I lost a part of it. But on Sioux Legends and Nellie Tubos tells this story. It's a woman weaving a robe, quilling a robe. And she has a fire pit and she has a dog right here. So she gets up to go to turn her meat on the fire. It's called Pilerea. Pilerea means when you're going to really honor somebody your elder, child, visitor, you take some dry meat, you make a fire, and you pelerea, you roast that meat for them. So it's fresh, it's warm, and it's really delicious. So we used to always steal our grandma's papa. <laughs> Be out in the back making a little fire and cooking it up. And But sometimes we'd start a grass fire, so they'd catch us. <laughs> so anyway, that story says this woman's over here and she's doing this roasting this meat and so behind her what's happening is that dog's watching her and he goes she goes up there so he goes and he rips out her quill work and then she sits down again and she continues to weave so the story is that when this robe is finished the world would end and so I thought it was spring because the dog represents the thunder beings. He's the food to the thunder beings. And those people who have that dream, that's their dream. They have their own instructions. So he represents the thunder, and that quill work there would, would represent the thunder each year coming back when we finish the cycles. And it would be the beginning again. So that's what that dog represents there spring so when she goes over there to the fire that's the sun dance that's the mid part of the year when there's a lot of buffalo there's a lot of food it's fertility it's abundance it's uh when we have our sun dance when we gather our people uh when we have womanhood ceremony because it 
should be at the time of fertility and that the flowers are starting to bloom and so it's that time period so as everything blooms and it goes into the fall it's all these colors that you see the trees yellow orange red the abundance flowers food so I thought that story was the spring and here it's the fall and so those those legends are what we have in our beadwork so we're we're always making that quill work that she taught us fallen star woman and that this these robes that we bead what do they mean and it means this is like the covering of the earth and it, it takes us back to legends of um, in the beginning when there were only four brothers on the earth and uh, <clears throat> we've had some problems with interpretation with them um, with Walker and our creation is we come out of wind cave four men and three women and Walker's story is man and woman so I was talking with my twins how we do the math and this side it makes more sense to us <laughs> the three men and the four women so um, and there were always more women in our culture so that's one of the added bonuses of Lakota men is my grandfather had two wives and they got along it wasn't a problem it was economic they were in a time of war they were moving and a lot of men died lots in order for us to have all this land a lot of our young men died and so did women and children but those men who went out there and fought these battles for us they would leave widows so that's why we always have that extra there's always going to be more women in our culture so women never went to war it's only in the last or recent history that the United States developed a war policy and it was General Sherman who did that and it's written he says kill the women and the children too and that's just terrible policy that when they did that they took all the beadwork stripped them of their belongings their things and that's what we're looking for now calling it back so those things could be laid to rest because those are our belongings those are what our grandmothers made and so everything we have our people fought and died for what we have left so <coughs> anyway that's the, that story I wanted to tell and then the, the other story I wanted to tell how much time do we have I could talk five more hours I don't know. <laughs> oh, you guys could all make beds here and put you to sleep and if nobody says huh I'll stop talking <laughs> I had a real good teacher. I always tell about him when I was a little girl. He's my babysitter. His name is Dwight Afraid of Hawk, and he would tell us, um, If you can't talk Lakota, you have to just be quiet. And God, I'd sit there and I'd rack my brain to try to figure out what I needed, and then I got better at it. So. I commend him because he was my babysitter and he really taught me a lot and his family but he knew stories that nobody's known and they didn't write them down but his grandfather was Emil Afraid of Hawk and Emil Afraid of Hawk today is Rocky Afraid of Hawk and and if they're tuned in hi you guys we're still down here Bigfoot Riders but that man recorded stories for the Bureau of Ethnography and when I was a young mother at home I got to have copies from the Bureau of Ethnography so I read them every day I'd read a book about a different tribe and I self-educated myself because I had children at home I had cooking to do cleaning to do sewing to do but when I got up I would read my books because I lived all over this country and I went to um, Haskell Indian Junior College so I knew that we weren't the only people that this happened to and if we work together and gain strength that 
we'd all be a powerful nation. So a lot of our gifts would go like that to other people. So um, Emil Afraid of Hawk also built a campus up there at Pine Ridge High School, the Log Cabin. And we had really great grandfathers like that that were victims of war that recovered and said, this happened to us, but we're going to go on. We're going to build lives for our families. So he was another, there was another great man too. His name was Chief Lip. He built a school. And how they did it was women's beadwork and star quilts. They would sell them. Maybe in the 1920s, a pair of moccasins like this. You know how much you get for it? $20. So collectors came here and stole our beadwork again with really low prices. And that's what sits in these museums. And I wish they would have left the price tag on there when they bought it. Five bucks. I'll go buy it for five bucks. It's probably worth $5,000 today. So there's a real imbalance in there, you know, with Native American graves repatriation log, restoring artifacts to us, and then having repositories like this at Woksapi where we can house them. So it's like a library we could go back to and look at when we got beads, who got beads, and who didn't get beads. So it's real evident. Um, the dress of the followers of crazy horses called the Oyukhbe dress. And um, it's real simple. It's like this. And on this dress, there's a little medicine they tie. There's no beadwork, but right there. So these people didn't get beads. And they didn't go to the fort. They didn't go to the Bozeman Trail. So they didn't die of smallpox, cholera, typhus, flus. They didn't get beads. They also didn't have, like, metal. The metal they had was really old. They kept it for a long time. So this is called the Oyukhbe dress. And that is, today, that was um, Big Roads Band. These people were, they were hunted after the little bighorn in Montana. And they lived in 26 villages. So there were more people that were out there than at the forts. They, they would not give up because that way of life they felt was better. Felt it was better not to have beads or to have modern things. So they weren't part of the trade and commerce. So this is really a, this story here, the reason I, I tell this is I had an auntie named Florine Ice, and she was another one of my babysitters. So that's another one of my teachers who taught me Lakota. I really loved her. She was really a good woman, always happy and really loving, just hug you, and make you feel wonder. But she was Miss Sundance at Pine Ridge one year. I think it was 1964. And then all the girls contestants came out with all this beadwork on and, and she had nothing on and they said, why, I remember the question, I remember all the questions that they asked her, they said, why, who are you from and where are you from? And she said something to effect of, can't you tell who I am because I have on the Oyukhbe dress. Our people didn't get beads, so she was Miss Sundance, that dress won her that title because she was the most traditional one because she, she had no beadwork. And before then that there was, you know, they put quill work on her. So it was plain a plain dress told who this who these people are. And then as they got older they put quill work. And um, so I, I guess it's cool. And then I have a beaded dress that I from a little when I was a little girl and I remember wearing it and I was telling one of my friends, I said, you ever see these grandmas when they're dancing about in kind of towards evening, they're tired and it seems like they're hunched over more and more because <laughs> that doggone dress is really heavy. <laughs> so it weighs you down because if you think about 
putting on a dress and I was a little girl and I weighed my dress and I think it weighed nine pounds it's like wearing nine pounds of armor <laughs> yeah. so those dresses are really heavy and they're uncomfortable so I don't think I'd have on a fully beaded buckskin dress to go get water or go chop wood or you know do some mopping <laughs> it'd be totally crazy to do that it'd be ridiculous so that's the story of the dress and one of the amazing things about this pattern is you could take this dress and um, it goes to that legend of the four brothers. And I, was, I forgot, this, skipped over on it. One of them gets a sticker in his toe. And I remember getting a sticker in between my toes and I was limping and I didn't want to tell my mom what I did because I didn't have my shoes on. So I had this festered toe overnight and she had to lance it and cut it and here it was an arrow sticker and here it like germinated so my grandmother said this is that story of those four brothers he got a sticker in his toe so he pulled it out and he had a wooden bowl and in the night he kept hearing a baby cry and say where and he'd look and he couldn't see it in the morning he heard that the sound said where so he looked in there and he was a little tiny baby girl that was that sticker and she reached for him so he pushed her away here she grew a little bit bigger and she reached for him again and he pushed her away and she's like 10 11 years old and she reached for him and he pushed her away and she's a woman and this woman is one of the stories of fallen star so she became a, a sister and she would make all these beautiful things and she's the one when she'd open her bag, all these birds, was her wee zipka. So through her stories and her creativity, that's how I learned about how to make beadwork. And it was a real beautiful story. So in, in our story, this is a Leland Lil Dog story that he taught me. And I kind of knew some of it, but when we're kids and we're playing, sometimes we don't have time our grandparents and we lose knowledge that way so we, that's why they tell us like four or five times six times sometimes so this is the the south wind right here and this is the east wind and this is the north wind and the west wind but there's one more wind it's the little boy that they don't talk about he's right here and he's the world wind see so I added more to it because fallen star woman Wohbe marries the south wind in the end and what she does is this dress I was talking about the similarity of how these the dress is cut like that that's like these are the sleeves and those are that's her dress right there so the dress and the teepee and even how a man's shirt is cut they're all similar to really similar design you could actually say that our dress is like our teepee, it's like our home and we adorn ourselves. That's our protection and we're inside of it. So Fallen Star was the oldest, I mean uh, Wazia. Okay, so this is Weohbe Oh I say South <laughs> Itoka Itoka uh, East Wind Weohiampata. Waziata, he's the strong, the oldest brother, and Weohbeata, so he said, well, I should marry this woman. So when he goes to court her, he's so cold, he freezes her. So her dress is all frozen. So she gets down under it, and she makes another dress. And she starts going. So he pursues her. So my analogy is Wazia causes these ice ages all over the world <laughs> in pursuit of fallen star woman. But I think the geology, we could figure it out, you know, earth science, when these events happen, because our stories can tell actual events that happen. So who saves her is the south wind and the east wind. They come and they warm, warm it up and they get her out. So eventually she marries the south wind and they live together and the whirlwind is their companion and they're right there. So if you look in the middle of your hand, Everybody look in their hand. You have a teepee. 
And if you don't, let me see. <laughs> yeah, so we all have it, so it's a universal symbol. So maybe our story went, maybe we populated the whole world. Maybe it was us. So we have some good theories. So, oh, so the one I wanted to tell was the double women, and this one is, um, oh, shucks, how does this work? The double women is our story of, um, and a, a lot of our, our young students are learning Lakota, and I'm really proud of that because, you know, they're learning. Um, most full blood people here know colloquial, just grew up understanding it. And um, so when they see it, you know, they get it because they already know. But there's like the um, orthography. German and French is confusing, so I just write phonetically. I write it the way it sounds, and I'll repair it if I have to type it. But my granddaughter, um, Teilani, told the story of Fallen Star because I told her this story over and over and over again. And I I tell her in Lakota in here. She um, recently told the story, and uh, she got an award for telling the story. So. The story begins with two women sitting, and they're looking at two stars. And Ti'i uh, Chahyankab, they're sitting against the teepee. And one says, I want to marry that bright star. And the other one says, well, I want to marry the dim star. And then they go to sleep. Ishtimampi. Yukha kiktab ampaham binkha makhbiyak daumpi. They were in the sky, they woke up in the sky. And the sky was all the same, same plant, same everything. And those two men were, that, the stars, they were two men. The dim star was an older man, and the bright star was a young man. And we call these the pole stars up there. So they were real happy, everything was good. And here one day, one, one of them noticed, she said, I'm going to have a baby. So she said, we got to go home. And the other one said, there's no way, we're here. So the men were going to go hunting, so they said, um, you can eat all this food, but you can't eat this timsila. And it's a tuber, it's real pretty, it's grayish green, it has purple flowers. It's one of our staple foods. And everyone, all of our tribe goes to gather these because that's how we don't have milk in our diet, so it's in our food pyramid that we have to eat this in order to build calcium for our bones. And if you eat it all your life, you won't ever get osteoporosis. Your teeth won't fall out, everything. It's all those nutrients are in there for our bones. And there's actually four kinds of timsila that we don't know about. There's uh, one that's a medicine. There's one that's a, like connects. It's a root system. It's a sloha. And there's one called the biscuit root. And that's the one that we pick early. But because of um, land management here, a lot of vast areas where these foods grew, the cows ate them up, trampled the ground, destroyed it, or fields were plowed. So those are really hard to find, but they do grow by the black hills. So these women are looking, and then they get this team seal on, and she pulls it out, digs it, and pulls it out. She looks at it, and she says, gee, it's like a rope had a long root. So she gets an idea and starts digging them. And pretty soon she's dug so much that we have this story that we grew up learning. She made a hole in the sky right here. She made a hole in the sky in the Big Dipper. And so she sent her team Sila braid down here. And she was coming down, but she fell. She fell to the earth, and she gave birth to Fallen Star, a little boy. And because his father is half star, he had like Superman powers. It's like our story of Superboy. And he could become anything. He could become a rock, he could become a leaf, a flower, a bird, an eagle. So he's our hero. It's not Iktomi. <laughs> Iktomi is a character. So, but 
they said, well, what happened to the other woman? So when I was having my fourth baby, because I'd had a star dream when I was a little girl, I had a dream of a blue woman here in the middle of the Big Dipper. She was standing on a star right here, and she was blue. So I made a ceremony, and I prayed that I would... Um, because when, when women are given birth all over the world, you face death because you, you might die. There might be complications if your midwife isn't competent or you might have something wrong with you and you could die. So given birth, every time we give birth, we face death for the, to bring new life here. We have to face death to bring life. So that's the blue woman. And today, many people know her. Her name is Tui, Auntie. We call her, we say that's the word for Auntie, but it's Tui. Her name is Blue Woman. And this is Fallen Star and Fallen Star Woman. They say, well, how could Fallen Star Woman die and be born again? If they were Lakota and they went up there and they're sacred, what does it tell us? That we're sacred. <laughs> it's just that simple. So fallen star woman is the mother of fallen star. So she's Wokbe again. So she's a symbol. She becomes She's over and over again in our culture in different forms. And she's a healer. And she's white, also white buffalo calf woman. So that kind of would make people sit and ponder, you know, how could this woman have so many things she could do? Well, because she was sent from the Creator to do this work, that's why. It's as simple as that. So that was my story. And um, over in St. Eglishka, we did a book, Research. And I went out to, mid to interview midwives, and all those midwives had something really um, alike, similar, is that they all did some type of beadwork. They did artwork or they did sewing, and all of them had just beautiful stories of how they brought life into the world. And there was even one story that I want to really attribute to Gus Yellowhair's mom, Loretta Worldwind Horse. And it tells, it's, it's maybe breaking boundaries or whatever, and it's like the first time women are allowed to talk about their, their place in society and how they fit. But we do most of the work at the home. And then we go to work and do all that work. Then we work when we come home, and then when we're asleep, we're still working solving problems. <laughs> so a lot of the, the labor intensive stuff happens with women. So I always think that, you know, we got to find a way to create co-ops, cooperatives. So when we have lots and lots of people who don't have income, and I did that in Wundini, was to create a co-op and teach everyone how to bead or to quill. And it was to give the kids something to do besides watching TV or movies. Or, you know, saying you don't have nothing to do. And they could test their artistic skill. So maybe some didn't bead, some didn't quill, but some drew and some painted. And some got real good with leather. And I felt that because it was my community and these are people I grew up with. And we were all Lakota speakers. So they were my teachers. So there was something I wanted to give back. So that's how I did that for Wounded Knee, and if our, our next phase, if we could find a way to get supplies for people or do more wor workshops and teach more kids, our culture will never die. And these things will keep being made and our people will wear them. And they say, well, why do you, why do you Lakota really like to dress up? I said, we dress up because we could die at any moment and we want to be ready to go to God, you know, well-dressed, gee, <laughs> they might not let you in. <laughs> but that's, that's why people always looked their best, and they were really adorned. 
And one of the terms that they, I heard when people were really wealthy and had provisions, they called them washecha. So washecha means they were really well adorned. And there's a place in Minnesota that I never seen, never didn't know nothing, but my great great grandma told me that our Dakota, this is what that place was. They were wealthy. They were when they came they had no claw, no beads when the first trappers came, first white men. And all they seen were these beautiful people and there's descriptions of them that they have the best fur wraps on. They have beautiful quilled buffalo robes. And where did all that go? So the Sa'un, the white buffalo robe keepers, the Dakota band, that's what they seen, was that they were really wealthy people. And, and you could imagine why, you know, non-Indians get mad at us when they say, well, you call us Oshichu. And that's derogatory. So my bro said, well, when that washi Chu came, it was washing Chu. He was starving. He was all cut up and full of sores, and his clothes were all ragged. And he snuck up on that grandma's village and stole her her meat and her fat. So she had a stick saying, "Washing Chu, washing Chu." So that's our first picture of them. So you know, it's not to put down a whole race, but he was the first one they seen. So. The next one they came that that was, you know, pretty well dressed, they were they called them what they were, they were adorned, so they were hopecha. And that word comes right out of this right here. Hopeh and ho hopecha. And so that's in the likeness of this beautiful woman that they would you would describe hopecha, handsome or beautiful. So that's how much I got. And did Paula come back? Yeah. Oh, okay. The story of Tomi is she comes to all women when they're birthing. And um, at Pioneer Hospital, they have a, a, a real cool policy now. They know that. You know, there's no possibility that when these babies are born, one of the things I seen with my grandchildren was when blue woman brings the baby down, I'll draw my hand here, sometimes the baby's birthmark might be like this big on the baby's back. Gee, not that big of a fat finger. <laughs> but it's blue. It's a blue mark like this. It's the blue hand, and sometimes it might be both of them, the both hands like this. I can't draw it by left. But this, the Pine Ridge Indian Hospital had to acknowledge that something was happening with these babies because they would have these hand marks on them like that. Gee, that one looks like a claw. <laughs> so now our hospital, the midwives, are really understanding that we have what's called the the mongoloid spot. So yeah, that she brings the baby down, gives it to you. So a lot of our babies have this. And when they have this, that's the connection to the star people. So they call it Hoya. So we're, when we go back up to the, go back to the creator, there's a story that goes with this, and it's about a man who died, and he was walking, and walking down this road, and he comes to a, a fork in the road, and there's a grandmother sitting there with a king. And she said, you, you're dead now, huh? He said, yeah. I said, so uh, what do you think? Do you think you deserve to come in here? And he said, yeah. So uh, what did you do on earth when you were alive? And he said, oh, I lived a good life. I was a hunter. I had a wife. I had kids. I said, well, were you kind to old people? No, why should I? They're going to die anyway. Well, were you kind to orphans? No, that's their problem. They don't have relatives. Well, were you kind to animals? 
he'd kick dogs. So she said, you can't come here, you're too mean. You didn't do nothing to deserve to come in here to see your relatives. You're too mean, you're stingy, so I'm going to give you this blue paint and you can go back down there. I'm going to send you down, back down and you're going to wake up and you're going to be alive and you're going to have this blue paint. And he said, and she said, you're going to make relatives with this blue paint. So when you go back, you make relatives and you mark that blue paint on your face, three lines. When you die again, you come back and if you have that, I'll let you in. Because that showed you made relatives and you, your relatives are really important. You're loyal, you're the connection. So she kicked him back and he woke up with a bag of blue paint. And he said, this is the ceremony I must do. And that's what we do today, this hunka. But we're missing our blue paint. So, but anyway, that's at Pine Ridge Hospital. And I like that because it takes a long time for a bureaucracy to accept women's way of thinking. But I think we're moving forward, so. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Okay. How are we with time? Good? Okay. How much more we got? Oh, good. All right. Well, I want to send a greeting out to everybody on behalf of Oglala Lakota College. And um, this sherry here really means a lot to me because my Uncle Gerald One Feather started this college and I was young. And my, grand, my grandson, he gave him his name before he died, his second name. So his name is Onashola and his second name is Shunka Khan Gleshka. Shunka Khan Chik Ala Gleshka. His name is Lil Spotted Horse. So my grandson carries my uncle's little boy's name. And he's real proud. So, um, like the, all the people who put this college together because it's, it's our way of learning. And if we think differently, it's, it's okay. We're, we're not like everyone else. We're unique in our own culture, our own world. And then also because we're only 60 miles from our homeland. They didn't, they didn't make us go on Trail of Tears or do what they did to our Diné relatives or what happened in Canada. We didn't get everything, but we're pretty close to where we started. So send everybody a greeting and tell all my teachers, Wopila, and everyone tune in today on YouTube. Thank you. Two good students. Thank you very, very much for being here. Hmm? Give you these. Oh, the thank you. And the book on parflesh. Oh, wow. Your Jeez, wow. I'm going to have to make much. much parflesh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you want, um, Paula, if you want to bring a bag, and I'm, I'm going to leave these moxins, these baby ones with you today.